church walls. We have a long tradition of offering our hearts, stretching our minds, and extending Christ's hands to those in need. We are a congregation of hope and an open place of worship that seeks to share the good news beyond the conventional barriers of fellowship. Hi, I'm Brent Scott, a senior pastor at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. It is our desire that you will be inspired by today's message of hope for a diverse community in search of God's love.
join me in the prayer of confession found in your order of worship? God of the past, the present, and future, you fulfill your promise to always be with us. Forgive us for ignoring your presence and not loving you with our whole heart. We confess we have denied your love and have not shared your love with others. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His life was given for the redemption of many. His sacrifice atones for all our sin. I can assure you that God, our creator, has forgiven us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, as forgiven people, let us share God's peace and love with one another. Good morning, boys and girls. Hello. Good morning. Hey. Well, I have something to share with you this morning that is hopefully interesting to you. You know, usually we come up here and we talk about what's going on as far as the scripture reading or something like that. But today is a special Sunday, and every Sunday is special, we all know that. But it's Senior Recognition Sunday. Do you know what that means? Okay, and you shouldn't yet because you're not seniors. And it's not, there are different definitions of the word senior. And this type of senior uh, that we are recognizing today are our graduates. Those that are graduating from high school this year. And you know, in the church, we, we try to, we, we make a commitment at your baptism uh, when you're baptized as a baby. Uh, to be with you and on your journey of faith all of your life, not just until you graduate from high school. But we, you know, you've seen baptisms in the church. You're paraded down. We call that the baby parade. Take you all the way down and show you off. Sometimes we baptize adults, but we still make the same promise that we're going to walk with you as a community of faith all of your life, okay? We honor you again as third graders and miss cindy and miss christy give out bibles to all of our third graders some of you have gotten those bibles and those bibles stay with you and once again that's just a piece of our commitment to you because we want you to grow in your faith and then again at confirmation you come up and you join the church on your own decision does that make sense you you learn about the church you learn more about god and then you get to say i'm going to commit my life to being part of the church and again this community says, I'm going to be there and I'm going to support you. And then this happens. And as you go off to college or into the military or to work or whatever you are going to do after high school, this community once again says, we love you, we support you, and we're going to be with you all of your journey. And then you come back. And as members of the church, you make that commitment 
to other young people that are sitting up here that you are going to get to know them and you are going to be part of their journey of faith. So when we talk about a church family, you know, it's kind of different than the family you live with. But it's also very similar because whether these people know your names, they know your face, and they know what you believe, and that makes you part of God's family. Will you pray with me? We thank you, God, for these young people here. We thank you for our seniors as they uh, prepare for the next step of life. We ask you to continue to let all of us be part of your family and to love and support each other in this community of faith. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, boys and girls. be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we seek you and long to find you, give us grace to understand that others are seeking you in their own ways. Help us see in all your children your presence and your love. Change our distrust toward those who call you by different names into genuine love and compassion. For we know that you, as parent of us all, are their parent as well as ours. And as our parent, we know that you hear our prayers. Lord, in all the places around the world, across our nation and in our city where there is unrest and fear, brokenness and a sense of futility. We pray for your constant care. May hearts be open to your presence in all these situations and give us strength and courage to work against embedded systems that keep some always in power and others always in poverty and therefore subject to every kind of oppression. Lord, in our own congregation this morning, we offer prayers of concern and sympathy for April Owens and her family in the death of her father, Philip Hopkins, and prayers of concern for those who are sick and those who were hospitalized this week, Anna Adamson, Shirley Crawford, Richard Ford, William Gillum, Boo Jennings, Lawrence Labarer, Steve Lahosky, Bob Sells, and L.J. Wolf. Lord, surround all of these with your comfort and your peace. And we offer prayers of joy this morning for the baptisms of Sutherland Caroline Burton, child of Holland and Scott Burton, of Christian Alexander Lopez, child of Beth N. Glade and Alex Lopez, of James Matthew Niblett, child of Brooke and Matt Niblett, and of Mary Margaret Womack, child of Brooke and Wes Womack. And we offer prayers of joy this morning for Ashley Giles and Jonathan Coleman in their recent marriage. And we thank you and rejoice in our new member, Wanda Fonts. Be with all of these who are at the beginning of new relationships with us and with one another and help us all to uphold our vows to one another and to you. Lord, hear our prayers this morning offered in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
you are invited to stand for the reading of the scripture, which is Genesis 21, 9 through 20 in the Old Testament. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy or because of this slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. As she departed, she wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look upon the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and let her see a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up, and he lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And, you know, the sign I saw outside uh, for the, you know, as I was walking up, it says, uh, love God and love your neighbor. And this is essentially what Islam is. It teaches you to love God. And the Prophet said something very similar to what you will find in the sayings of Jesus Christ and Moses. And that is that none of you will believe or none of you do believe until you love until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. So, this is a, a core principle of, of the religion. You have a responsibility towards God, that you worship Him, that you fast, that you go on pilgrimage, and you pay uh, charities. These are all part of your responsibility towards God. The main one being that you don't take anyone other than God as an object of worship. And then you have a responsibility towards people that you deal with them with fairness, that you deal with them uh, in a manner that uh, you know, brings about uh, prosperity and brings about peace uh, among nations. And there's clear guidance with regards to doing that. In his autobiographical book entitled Brother to a Dragonfly, the late Will D. Campbell, Mississippi-born Baptist preacher, author, and civil rights activist who was among those who escorted the Little Rock Nine into Central High School in 1957, tells of a childhood moment of great intimacy between him and his brother Joe. Five-year-old Will has just returned home from spending several days with his grandparents on the other side of the river. No sooner does he walk through the door of his home than his seven-year-old brother Joe grabs him by the arm, drags him out the front door and down a muddy pathway to look at something he has buried. 
Here it is, Joe shouts. After looking a while, here it is, I've found it. And with that, Joe knelt down and unearthed a bare aspirin box. Will, I caught a skeeter hawk Sunday, and I buried it alive in this bare aspirin box, and, and I told myself I'd open it on Wednesday. And if it was still alive, that would mean you were coming home this day. I'll bet you it's alive. And as both brothers, the five-year-old and the seven-year-old, moved ever closer together, Joe reached down with his thumb to pop open that bare aspirin box. And Will Campbell writes in his book that in that moment, two brothers stood as close as two brothers could possibly stand, peering into that bare aspirin box, looking for life. In a very real sense, this is where we stand this morning with this message, this sermon on Islam. With the uh, other messages in this series, the previous messages on on Hinduism and, and Buddhism, there is a kind of otherness to those faiths, isn't there? There, There's a different scope and and tone entirely. They're a little removed from our experience and, and we can keep them at arm's length. But we can't do this with Islam. We we can't. Because we're about as 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 close as siblings could possibly be. There is life. There's life between The two of us, we are related. We are family. We are kinfolk with our fellow Muslims. We share a family tree. We share share a family album. And this is where, this is where, this is especially difficult. Because anyone who knows anything about family knows that in a family where there's more than one sibling, more often than not, there is sibling rivalry, right? As in Cain and Abel and Cinderella and her stepsisters and and tennis stars, Venus and Serena Williams. Where there are siblings, where we're kinfolk, sometimes competition rears its ugly head and can even lead to hostility. This is certainly the case with these two faiths. And it's certainly the case in this story from the 21st chapter of Genesis that you just heard. Let me review it for you. Abram and Sarai, not Abraham and Sarah, their names are changed later, but Abram and Sarai are invited by God to leave their home in Haran, their family home, and to go to a place that God will show them an undisclosed destination where God promises Abram and Sarai that they will become a great nation. Their people, their heirs will number more than the stars in heaven. And so Abram and Sarai go. They they, they follow God. There are stars in their eyes. It's, It's not all so altruistic. It's that they know that there is something coming to them. And so they follow God, and they go, and they go, and they go. And years pass, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, but it seems nothing is really happening. There really is no great nation. There are certainly no heirs numbering the stars in the heavens. They don't even have a single child. They haven't had a baby yet. By now, Sarah is in her mid-80s. Her biological biological clock has more than wound down. It's keeled over and died. I mean, there is no way this couple will ever have a child. And so Sarah takes on the role of God. She takes matters into her own hands. She, She will have a child. And she decides to do it through surrogacy. She decides to do it through her maidservant, her slave, Hagar. This child, 
the child of this woman will be my child. And so at Sarah's suggestion, and even her instigation, Abraham, now in his mid-90s, and this young, beautiful Egyptian slave, Hagar, are sent away for a romantic weekend where they get pregnant together. They come home, and nine months later, nine months later, Hagar gives birth to a son, Ishmael. Mission accomplished. Sarah now has her child. But it doesn't go so well. Hagar suddenly develops an attitude. She becomes downright uppity. She takes on an air of superiority because she can make babies and, and her, her superior cannot. Sarah hates Hagar now. She despises her and her presence. That is, until a few years pass, and at the age of 89, Sarah becomes pregnant. And at the age of 90, she gives birth to the child that God has promised her all along. A son. She names Isaac, which means laughter, because this really is funny stuff, isn't it? Now whose turn is it to be uppity? Sarah becomes uppity. She doesn't want this woman in her house, nor does she want her child in the house. And she goes to her husband Abraham and tells him so. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. She doesn't even use their names. Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. And you know what? Abraham does as Sarah asked. This spineless little man, this spineless twit, sends Hagar and Ishmael, his own son, his own flesh and blood, into the desert to die. Did I tell you this is a story about a very dysfunctional family? Gives hope for all of us, doesn't it? But God intervenes. And God saves Hagar and Ishmael. And while it is obvious that this great nation that God has promised Abraham and Sarah will come down through the line of Sarah's son, Isaac. God also promises Hagar. The only time God makes this kind of promise to a woman in the Old Testament, God promises Hagar that her son, Ishmael, will likewise be a great nation. Genesis 21, 17. What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. This is it. This is our story. This is the story of siblings. This is the story of the nations of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. The descendants of Isaac will become the nation of Israel. And Israel will produce a great line of kings, among them King David. And a descendant of King David will be Jesus of Nazareth, who is the greatest king in human history, the Savior, the Messiah, the, the giver of life, the, the, the Lord of, of hope. This is Jesus. And likewise, the descendants of Ishmael will become the nation of Islam. And more than 600 years after the birth of Jesus Christ, a prophet named Muhammad will be born in Mecca. And just like, just like his siblings, just like his fellow Christians and Jews, Muhammad will embrace a theology of monotheism 
a firm belief that there is one God and one God alone, Allah. And just like Judaism and Christianity, Muhammad, Muhammad will proclaim the power of prayer, its integral role in the life of the faith. Do you know that Muslims pray five times every day facing Mecca, always with their heads bowed to the ground? It's powerful. Would that we Christians were as committed to prayer as those who are Muslim. And just like Jews and Christians, Islam will have its own holy book, its own holy writings. And in this book, in the Quran, there will be interspersed references to our own Old Testament and New Testament heroes, Adam and Noah and Moses. John the Baptist is in the Quran, as is Mary, the mother of Jesus, and even Jesus Christ himself. We're siblings. We're family. There's a closeness. But there's also a rivalry. And while there's many, many commonalities, there are some stark differences as well. Islam does not embrace the mystery of the Trinity. The, the, the belief that God, this one God, became manifest in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And unlike our, our, our Bible, unlike our Old and New Testaments that were, were written by dozens and dozens of inspired people over a period of more than a thousand years, Islam will claim that its book was dictated verbatim by Allah, by God, in a relatively short span of time. And wherever the Quran and the Bible disagree, Islam will say the Quran is right. The Quran is right, and the Bible is wrong. The Quran is right, and the Bible is long, wrong. And while and while Islam embraces and lifts up Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus is a prophet in Islam. He is no savior. Muslims do not believe that Jesus died on the cross because, quite frankly, prophets in Islam cannot die such horrific deaths. Islam does not believe that salvation comes by grace through faith, but rather by faithful and dedicated obedience to the law. So much in common and so much that is different. During the decade uh, we lived in northwest Arkansas, Karen and I became dear friends, close friends, to an Iranian-born Islamic family. Wonderful. They were professionals. He was employed with the university. She was an architect of some renown. As a matter of fact, she designed the addition and extensive renovations on the church I was serving as senior pastor. It was beautiful. It still shows those Islamic influences today. First United Methodist Church. But we became close. We became friends. We ate together. We played together. We even worshiped together. They, they visited our, our church frequently on, on Sunday mornings. And, and I guess you could say as siblings from different faiths, we stood about as close as siblings could possibly stand, peering into that bare aspirin box, exploring the mysteries of the faith and the life within. And then it happened. She converted to Christianity, and I baptized her. Not, not for anything that I had said, but rather by her deep conviction and connection to Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. But here's the thing. She also embraced her Islamic traditions. 
she held on to both. They became very, very important for her in her life of faith. It was about that time that a, that a newspaper reporter interviewed her for, for a, a major religious story in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and, and asked her about this, this tie between Christianity and Islam. And, and here's what she said. I love and respect Islam's true message of peace, equality, and compassion. But I also embrace and welcome Christianity's message of love and grace. I know that some people say I must make a choice. All I know is that I am in the middle of a spiritual feast and feel richer than ever. Beautiful statement, isn't it? May we all be blessed to experience this same richness in our own journey of faith. Amen.
As our ushers come forward, you're reminded to place your Connect card in the uh, plate as it goes by. And also, you're invited, if you give electronically, uh, there's an EFT card in your pew uh, if you'd like to have that physical action of placing something in the plate. And if you're interested in signing up for electronic tr fund transfer, call our finance office during the week and they can set you up with that. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you are the vine grower, and we belong to you. Thank you for carefully tending us, especially in difficult times. You provide what we need in order to grow as disciples of Jesus. Help us to abide in him, the true vine. May these offerings and our lives bear much fruit and bring glory to you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.
Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that in unity we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. with the confidence of the children of God let us pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen Today, we receive this sacrament of Christ's grace poured out for us through the method of intinction by coming down the center aisles with our hands cupped like this to receive the bread into our hands and then to dip it into the cup, returning by the outside aisles to our place of worship. In the United Methodist tradition, the table of the Lord is open to all because Christ is our host and Christ invites all of us to come. You are welcome. The feast is ready. Come and join.
invitation to you to attend our Membership Matters class today at noon. If you would like to explore the meaning of the faith through Pulaski Heights, we would welcome you to join us. Let us stand as we sing together.
thank you for joining us today at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. And I hope you enjoyed our worship service. May the peace, joy, and love of God be with you.